Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Happiness Aid and Happiness Co. interviews. Uh, we're going around interviewing incredible people uh, that have, uh, have incredible stories. I'm here with my old mate, Chad Morrison, uh, former West Coast Eagles player, uh, dad, uh, husband, business owner. How are you, mate? Yeah, good, Julian, mate. It's, uh, it's been a while since uh, I first met you down at uh, East Frio Footy Club, mate, many years ago when you are you know, ripping up the track. So it's uh, good to cross paths with you many times over the last few, few years and, and it's great to be involved in what you're doing now, mate. Thank you, mate. Yeah, it's, it seems like... Seems like so like a, a world ago that I was I was playing footy, and it seems like a world ago when you were down at East Brown as well. Life does happen so very quickly, doesn't it? Oh, totally. Yeah, like um, back then that was nearly over ten years ago. Now, when the last time I was at East Frio, so a lot of things have changed since then. You know, I've become a dad. I've got my own business and and doing other things, and you know, I obviously just got grown my back uh, love back into footy again by getting back into footy in the last few years as well. So it's uh, it's. Does its whirlwind of uh, changes, and as long as you enjoy what you're doing, that's the main thing. Yeah, so true, mate. And I, I love that comment about you getting more uh, back involved in footy because I'm sure that we're going to discuss that uh, over this interview today about your footy career and your life in football and uh, your hardships in footy. But uh, first, I just want to say thank you for jumping on. There's so many people that I know are going to get insights and awareness around your own life story because there's one thing I know that we have in common that our struggles are universal. So. Every single person on the planet uh, go, through, go through some hard times, uh, and as have you. But, mate, ISO life, it's been obviously a challenge, and I'm sure you've never ever seen anything like this in your life either. What have you been doing? What have, obviously, you run a really successful uh, personal training business, and you obviously you've got some footy clinics, and as you said, getting back involved with, with footy. But what have you been doing with your time in ISO life? Yeah, it's at, uh, the initial shock of when it uh, first happened, um, you know, I've been back with uh, West Coast Eagles at AFLW and we were uh, what, six, six games into our season. We had a couple more games to go and we played that, that last game and we were going, we're not, we might not be playing next week because all this started to start to happen and seeing what, what's happening around the world. So then, yeah, footy was cut off. Um, the Eagles season was finished with the girls. Uh, plus, I run footy academies um, with uh, Waffa, with uh, Ryan Turnbull and another one myself. That just completely stopped. And then obviously with my personal training business, that, that stopped as well. So, um, but it was, a, it was an initial shock. Um, I work from home in terms of my own business with my personal training Pilates. So um, I was able to adapt and keep that going with uh, like one-on-one -on -one clients and, and stuff like that. So just to keep my head above water, that was, that was okay and keep me sane. But in terms of life around everything else, because I've worked from home for the last 10 years, um, I wasn't in my wife's space anymore. I wasn't all this kind of stuff. So we, we got to have a really good relationship with my wife. So in terms of that kind of stuff, that didn't change. It's just my workload just decreased a fair bit. But then now over the last sort of month or so, last few weeks when the numbers increased for, you know, training outside and stuff like that, I've been able to, you know, get my footy stuff up and going and, you know, start get back to sort of normality. Um, and just with the kids probably going back to school, that's, that's probably been a, a blessing for the homeschooling parents out there. It's just, it can be quite challenging, but um, it's uh, yeah, just it's it's fairly normal now for us, and we're just glad we live in the place we live in in Perth, which is probably the best isolated place in, in the world. So true, mate. So true. And but I I remember when I was growing up, I would watch you on 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 the TV playing for West Coast, and obviously then then for Collingwood. And I guess one of the big questions that I wanted to ask you firstly is, you know, talking about your, your career as a, as a professional football player um, and your, your journey uh, through that, you know, the good times and the, the, the challenges that have come, because there's always two sides, right? There's the best times of our life and the, and the ones that put us the most amount of pain. But obviously, what was the best, you know, career highlight? You know, being a... AFL, you know, football player is of so many people's dream, um, including mine when I was growing up. And to be able to live that dream and, and be part of, uh, you know, the West Coast Eagles and playing for Collingwood, what was your best kind of career moment as an AFL footy player? Yeah, probably. Um, like, well, when you're playing, it's just uh, just amazing. Like you just said, then you you, you aspire to dream to play AFL footy. Then when it, the reality does happen. Um, I remember first being drafted, being a, I was a young Victorian and I got drafted at the age of 16 and 
And the last thing I think, oh no, I've got to go to WA. I was, I was, I was frightened, I was scared, but it was a highlight. But in the same way, I was going, oh no, my whole life is going to change. So that the change of then staying and finishing Year Twelve and moving over, that was awesome. But probably the highlight when you're playing is probably the camaraderie of your teammates. Um, you know, your, your, your milestones when you play your first game. Um, you know, winning big finals. You know, I unfortunately didn't play any grand, uh, any grand finals. My timing was, was out. I joined the club at 95. They just finished the 92, 94 era. And then I left to go to Collingwood in 2005. So that's when Eagles played the next two grand finals. So I missed out on both ends. But, uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was hopefully a big part of, you know, setting them back up to win those flags anyway. But like I said, the biggest highlights were just playing in big finals, winning, winning finals. But being a part of a, um, a, great, a great club like West Coast and Collingwood, you know, they, they, they sort of put things in place and in the right organisation that make you a better man. So I think you're connected to the football club, but the, if you walk into the club by getting drafted, hopefully you come out the other end of it, a better person uh, for the rest of your life. And that's what, I think that's a, that's a club's main aim. Yeah, incredible, mate. Mm. You know, obviously playing with uh, so many different players across, across both, both teams. Who would you say your favourite teammate was at the time at the, at the Eagles? Uh, and who, would, who, who was the best player you played with across your time in the AFL? Because you played with some absolute crackers. Yeah. Yeah, oh, like, teammates, you get, you get so, like, you get 40-odd guys on list and that's ever evolving and changing. So, probably, um, you know, Brett Hetty probably goes down probably the, my most favourite. You know, like, he, he actually picked me up for my first training session ever. And, um, and it was, I was like a young 17 year old boy and I probably didn't say boo in the car. He probably asked me about 20 questions and I didn't even say a word. And, but um, it's ironic, he, he became such a close friend and still now, like we only live like 300 metres down the road from each other now, which is ironic. And, you know, we've got that bent friendship and bond that started from, from that young time. So, but he's such a, like an upbeat character. He was just a bit of a life of the party of the group as well. Like you've always got people up and going. Uh, him and Dean Kemp were like sort of, you know, they used to feed off each other and really get the, the group up and going. Um, and then in terms of probably the, the later years, when I was at West Coast, you know, Michael Braun was a really close friend. We, we grew up in Melbourne together, um, went to primary school, started footy together, and just ironically, we, we played for the West Coast together as well. So he's probably one friend that um, he was great to play with and, and probably live the journey with as well. So incredible, man. There's so many, so many uh, amazing players that have come through West Coast. and. Because we're so, you know, we're obviously we're a two two team town, and uh, obviously the Eagles uh, are, are going through their next probably moment of success as a team. You know, being at the top of the ladder, and obviously probably having a, a chance at hopefully a grand final this year for the Footy Club. But there were so many great teams and, and and great combinations of players since the Eagles have been in the AFL. Oh yeah, like and. and that's the thing, like, the West Coast has been such a successful club over, the, over their tenure, like, how many, like, 30 odd years now. And, mate, they, they reinvent the wheel. They've got great leadership from up top, from Trevor Nisbet at the board. Um, but they, they, they got the right recipe for success. And I think that was achieved early in their, their, um, their start. And now, now they've just, you know, they've continued that. Their, their culture is about success and they're, and they're They've got themselves a big chance again in the next few years with, with obviously the list they've got and the talent they've got. So, and there's many other clubs out there, you know, Hawthorne, Geelong, you know, Sydney. They've been such powerhouse clubs over the years and have maintained that. And it's so hard for the next, every other club will try to emulate what they're doing. And it's so hard to maintain that success. And clubs can, that can play continued finals and give themselves the opportunity to win it are, are the ones that, who are financially going to be better off as well, you know, as you see what's happening at the moment. And, there's all the talk about, you know, the hardship of clubs where they're at. And there's only probably about two or three clubs that can keep their, their head above water at this time. And West Coast is definitely one of them. And Collingwood's one as well, you know. So, yeah. Mate, this is a, a question I noticed for you. So if you hypothetically got the call up and you could play in the 2018 Grand Final or you could play in the 2006 Grand Final, which team would you choose to play in? Well, I was, I was just retired at 2006, so um, it'd probably be 2006, because they're, they're all the guys my age as well. So they're all the guys that, um, you know, I did the journey with, like, literally leading up to those, those moments. But that, uh, those two grand finals are actually classic games. Uh, no, just, we're just probably 
um, that 2006 was I was, I was at the game watching as a spectator and then that was such an amazing experience. They're probably sometimes a little bit hollow at times because I, you know, I could have been there. But then the 2018 one, a couple of years ago, like, it's the first time I ever felt like a really true supporter, like, like when I was a kid, you know, like, elation, just celebration. It's just, it was riding every bump, every little tap, and, you know, it was just it's amazing for the footy club. It was just amazing for all West Coast Eagles supporters to, to witness that day. You know, it was such a great game. I know you are at Collingwood, uh, West Coast, or a Fremantle supporter now, mate. Um, West Coast by a mile, um, <laughs> and you know, always, it's always a soft spot for Collingwood because well, I grew up in Melbourne, and my whole family were Collingwood. So, going back to Melbourne for two years and playing with Collingwood, I lived the dream for my parents, my brothers. Um, you know, you're playing in the Anzac Day clashes, Collingwood, Carlton, Collingwood, Richmond. You're playing against 60, 80, 90 plus thousand fans, and I, I got to experience it. Um, I remember the, a special moment, I think, after I uh, played Carlton in 2005. I played on Kuda Fides all day, touched him up again. You know, boy, I used to play on Kuda all my whole, my whole career. And um, yeah, had a really good game. And, and I got in the car, I actually felt pretty emotional. And so I rang the old man in the car, put on speed for on the way out, and just sort of shared the moment, you know, like nearly tears, but just sort of shared the elation and the happiness of just, you know, emulating the Collingwood Carlton classes when we were five, six, seven, eight years old with our brothers wrestling each other and, you know, just you just lived that dream. You, I've finally lived that dream for, for everyone, you know. It was such a good, special moment. Mate, magical, mate, magical. And obviously, obviously such an incredible player uh, in your, I guess, your prime, but obviously... Uh, and, and sadly, you had some some challenges with injuries, and obviously that affected your career in I'm sure some challenging ways. But you know, you, you talked about your best time in in footy. What what would you put down to your your worst time in footy? And I know you've been really vocal about that, and I think that's incredible as a footy player talking about these things. But where would you kind of say that you struggled the most in your AFL career? Yeah, it was probably um, you know I was extremely fortunate. I, I never got injured for the first uh, six six and a half years of playing, you know, like nearly played every game straight, um, no injuries. And then all of a sudden against Melbourne one day as we're running at full pace and bang, t- um, tore the ACL, tore the meniscus, cracked the tibia. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I mean, I'm still invincible. I'm only 22, 23. Uh, I'll, I'll do my time and I'll, I'll, I'll be back out there in 12 months. So at that stage, I was fine. Then probably nine, 10 months into my rehabilitation, I um, tapped training. I think the boys had a good win the, on the on the weekend and a little bit excited after the meeting and went back on the track, went to do a little turn off the line, bang, just did me did me knee again. So that sort of was like, okay, I accept that. But probably about a month or two after the, the surgery, just I was I was out with my um, my my wife and I think I was at a bit of a party. I didn't really know many people there and it was just like someone just threw like a big wet blanket of sadness over me and I was like, I just couldn't get out of like crying and sadness and depression and and I thought, what's going on? And I said to my wife, I'm going to get out of the party, I'm going to get out and, and then for the next probably about four or five months, I was, I was a wreck. Um, couldn't even, you know, I was, when I was at the footy club, I was training by myself because I was isolated, I wasn't doing full training and then that. So the, probably the feeling of isolation and the feeling of, you know, I'm an AFL player. I've lost, I've lost my purpose. I've lost my, my, my everything that I stand for, and that was gone. And I, and I, I obviously struggled to deal with that. Um, I eventually, you know, you got better. I got fitter and started playing footy again. But, but that four or five pat, year, uh, month patch, I was, I was in all sorts. And you know, I conf- eventually confided in, in one of the doctors at the um, footy club at. Which, which ended up getting medicated for, um, and and then, but that's you, you carry those scars for the rest of your life, and um, you know, and as long as you you learn from that, and you and you try and adapt as you go, that that's that was um, the main thing from there. But then, you know, I've had many relapses at many a time with my with my depression. You know, I went to Collingwood and did my back twice. Um, so I ended up retiring at the age of 28, where I think when I thought I was going to play at 35 and play 300 games. Um, but, um, you know, then, you know, sort of going through sort of depression then, but it wasn't as, as harsh. 
in terms of, because I sort of had some resilience around it or from that first time with injury. Um, and then, you know, sort of learned to live with the ups and downs and this and that. But then, mate, only just two and a half years ago was probably my, my lowest point of my life was when, um, when my back from my uh, injuries from Connie would just got worse and worse and worse and got to a point where, um, you know, I've got a young family. I couldn't even pick up my kids. Um, couldn't do any exercise, which, you know, for me, uh, I like to exert myself to release a lot of tension and anxiety and, and all that kind of stuff. So that was probably the hardest thing for me being so, I'm going, well, I think I was at the age of 39. I'm going, is this me? I can't, I, I'm not going to be able to do this again. I'm, I can't do this again. And well, I, I, I got to suicidal thoughts, and which was quite, um, I couldn't believe I was thinking that way. It's, I was going, what is going on? Things are creeping in. And, and lucky enough, I've got a really good support network around me with my wife. And as you know, me and her have done some mental health stuff, you know, in the past. Um, I openly spoke about it instantly. And just probably having that instant um, release and talk about um, helped help me straight away a little bit. But just then we put the right building box in place after that to make sure um, things are going well. And I think, well, where I am right now, I feel like I'm in the probably the best spot of my life, you know, and I'm sure there's going to be ups and downs along the journey in the future, but I feel like every time I've gone through different challenges, I've bounced back and learned about myself a bit more and as long as I'm um, putting the right things in place, hopefully I can, I can be at my best and supportive to my family. Amazing, man. And what a, what a, what a share. And I appreciate that. And I know how difficult it is, but at times when you're going through these moments and I just know how powerful it will be for the people listening to this interview about, and I think what I take away from what you said is feeling invincible. And I think that's even magnified being an AFL football player. It's like, I think men at times have this sense of invincibility anyway. And then they, then you take that to the AFL football club and you feel like you uh, you can't be stopped. And then some injuries get in your way. And as you said, out of nowhere, uh, you described it as a wet blanket of that and you know then describing that you had suicidal thoughts and I think the key was that you said that you started talking about it instantly um, why, in your experience and you've been around footy clubs and you're back in footy clubs now why do you believe that it's so hard for people you know especially men uh, to talk about the way they feel and, and then leading into having suicidal thoughts What's, what, where, do, where do you reckon it stems from Probably uh, stems from, I think, you know, that bravado, egotistic, you know, we are in some way. Like, it's, you, you, you don't want to show any sign of weakness. Um, like, for me, when I was playing footy in the early 90s, no way you'd show, like, you don't want to say, oh, I'm hurting here or this and that or at any time. Like, because it's, you just don't want to show, oh, I, I might be a little bit weak in certain areas. If you're weak in that area, you, you're, you've got no, no purpose or no strength about you at all. But, you know what? how it's all evolved in the last, you know, 15, 20 years, and especially in the last 10 years, it's, you know, showing that vulnerability and showing that openness on how you feel is so important because you just, you, you don't realise that the guy next year has probably been feeling the same. And and getting those connections with each other it builds a stronger friendship of community and people around you because, you know, being back involved in the footy club with the West Coast now, you see that connection and one of our pillars is connection and, and, and that openness to talk about any scenarios and the support networks of each other around you, it's, it's vitally important. And, you know, being and seeing it from both angles, the kids and people these days, yes, it's always gonna be hard to come out and say something, but at least now we've got better platforms, better people around us to not f fear that you feel weak. But it's not weakness, it's strength. It's power. It's it's everything. All right. So that's that's where I want to share with my family and the people I, I deal with, even young teenagers that I train now. Um, it's not all about footy, footy, or the power. I want to be this and this and that. It's about having a good balance in your life and and having that openness that we're all we're all human. Yeah. So true, mate. And, and as you said before, that you actually when you share something, quite often the person next to you has had the same thoughts, always feeling the same things. And you, it's like nearly you give them permission to be vulnerable as well. Um, 
And, you know, you, you see this in lots of men's life. Lots of men at their times have had really dark thoughts and sad thoughts and at times had some suicidal ones. But it doesn't make people any less than. It just means that we, are, we feel stronger that we can share and be accepted for, for these thoughts and feelings. And for, for you personally, was it a fear of judgment when you were at the footy club? Or was it a fear of maybe not getting picked? Because like, I, I see this a lot. Is it a fear of what my peers will think of me in a workplace? Or is it a fear of they maybe think I can't do my job properly? Yeah, oh no, it was probably at the time, was just, just fear of, um, I just being, probably, yeah, being judged by my peers and, um, or, but I, I wasn't just people at the footy club I pushed away, I pushed away like my friends, um, even my family members, you know, like, because just living in Perth, my mum and dad and family were in, were in Melbourne, you know, when I went through the first time. And, yeah, you know, you just probably the fear of saying anything, because you just felt weak and you just didn't want to let them down. Um, but all you need to tell is one person, you know, like as long as you tell that one person, you've got someone, that one person to connect with. For me, it was my wife. Um, for anyone, it could be a, um, a stranger, it could be, um, you know, a teammate or a work colleague, or it could be anyone. But as long as you've got that one person, it doesn't have to, you know, broadcast it to the world, but, um, you know, but as long as you've got that one person to, connect with and you know and then they they are supportive and they they listen to you and put their arms around you and you know they don't they don't they might not have the solution but at least you've connected and and then we can work from there you know that's that's really important to have at least you've got someone who's around you that can support you it's so true and i think once you start talking about it you start providing the infrastructure to start feeling better don't you because if you don't talk oh. about it like it's nearly impossible to find a solution to it yeah, and then and that instant release you get from from talking about it, it's just, it's like, oh, shit, I've just pulled that piece of skin off, you know, and the next piece, layer of skin and, you know, and, you know, you see, you see and you do meet, and you, know, you probably see it in yourself, Julian, you meet people and you go, you know, you, you're there to support them. Um, you don't want to, you can't, you can't push people to be a certain way, but you're just there to support. And then with the right self-development areas in their life, then, then you can see them start to shred those skins off. You can see the person, the true person they want to be come out. And that's what we, you, you want to see with anyone in your life, you, whether it's family or friends or anyone around you. You just want to see them to shine brighter and be the person who they really want to be. And, you know, and you can't push them to do it. They've got to want to do it themselves. Yeah, mate, magical. And I think it's incredible that you... Um I've been such a spokesperson for mental health. So I think that, uh, again, I saw you on the media a few months ago uh, talking about it. Uh, and, you know, in, in my time knowing you, last, obviously I knew you back in the East Fremantle days, but you know, so I think we reconnected a few years back. Um, and I remember you talking about it then. And it was, such, it was so profound because it, it shows that um, good men out there are trying to make a difference. And I think by speaking about it, you allow the platform for so much to change. So uh, a credit to you, mate. Thanks, Mike. And uh, you touched on your worst, uh, maybe a few years ago, about two and a half years ago, maybe your worst time of your life, you know, in terms of how you were feeling. But obviously, there's been some incredible highlights, and you know, football is only a, a chapter of your life. And you're, you know, you're not a footy player. You're, you're, you're Chad Morrison. You're, a, you're a man. You're a son. You're a dad. You're a husband. In your personal life, taking away the professional accolades that you've achieved, what would you say your 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 best moment has been uh to date ah uh, it's just it's probably ever ever evolving and ever changing you know um when you're going to experience soon mate, having your first baby in the next couple of weeks but um that f family you know um, for me you know i've got two little girls now they're six and four and you know i've got a, a beautiful wife it's just the best moments uh those ever evolving ones when you, you you're with your kids and you're with your you're with your wife and and you just you can sit back and just see the little mini use or the little characteristics coming out of them and just see those little things in them. And then you can sit there and actually celebrate it with your wife and just look and go, how was this? You know, like, you know, I've got many clients and they're obviously kids are a lot older. Um, you know, they've finished school, they've moved on and whatever they're doing. Um, and they always say, treasure those little moments. And, and we do, I think we, me and Nat, we, we try and stay as present as possible um, and realistic. and being present just in the moment with your with your kids, that's that's probably the most 
rewarding thing you can ever be, I think. Because if you get distracted with work or anything, or the footy's going to come back on soon, I'm going to get distracted again. But um, if you can stay in the moment and present with your family, all those magical moments are there every day. So they're there. That's, 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 that's it for me. And I think the awesome part about that chat is that these moments are the easiest ones to find because they're quite often priceless and they're quite often right in front of you. Yeah, totally. And that's the thing. We, we try and search for this big magical moment or big thing in your life, but they're, they're, they're all around us nearly every day. And, you know, like, yes, it's hard at times and, you know, our kids and families can be challenging, but there is those glimmer of hope moments and really good magical moments during the course of the day that they're there, you know, and, and to see like maybe your daughter, you see a nice gesture from your daughter to a friend, you go, well, that's awesome. You know, those, those things that my wife's been telling the kids about manners or this and that, all those things that, you know, are gold, are gold moments for, for your family. So good, mate. So good. And I think advice is always important. Wisdom um, and, and sharing wisdom and knowledge and advice allows people to sometimes make less mistakes or fall over a little less along the journey. Um, if you remember who gave it to you, what, what, who was it and what was the best bit of advice that you've ever been given in your life? Well, the best bit of advice for me was um, probably when I was oh, about 15. Um, um, it was back, back to footy again. You know, footy's been a big part of my life. Um, you know, obviously being a real, a pretty talented young kid coming through, got drafted pretty early. Um, this coach um, really connected me. He always, he felt like he spoke to me. You know, he actually eye to eye, but not in a fearful, a commanding way. It was more just, hey, go on. Yeah, good. And I, I really responded to that. And, and I used to always have my thumbs taped. And, and then I think it was one of the, one of the finals we were playing in the under 18 competition. And, and he just wrote on my wrist, just be yourself. And, mm. um, and then I thought, yeah, like, and he just says, don't, don't try and be anyone, anyone else. Just you, you play to your strengths. You be the best you can be. And, but be yourself. Like play with no fear and, and back, back yourself in. And, and I've taken that with me everywhere I've gone. I've, you know, every time I've played with a new guy playing his first game at West Coast or Collingwood, I'd, I'd just give him a bit of a cuddle and I'd just go, mate, you're meant to be here. Be, be yourself. And I, and, I, and I always say that to, you know, all the, all the people I play with the footy. And, and I'm sure, you know, when I'm with my kids now, like I always say to them, I always give back to my family because I love them that much. But, you know, I love you because you're you, you know. You know, just... Just keep believing in yourself. Don't try and do anything else. And they're only young, but you know, having ingrained that self confidence and self worth is so important. I reckon if everyone in the world uh, had to go around with a tattoo on their wrist saying "Be yourself," it would be uh, one hell of a reminder. Because as you know, so many people are trying to keep up with the Joneses, comparison, expectations, and yeah. it's just, you're, you are so right. Being yourself, you you know, it's so easy to be yourself because you don't have to try hard to be yourself and quite often you get the best results because it's uh, the easiest thing to maintain is this being the person that you are authentically up. Yeah, totally. And, you know, comparisons, you know, they, and compare yourself to others can really bring you down because we're all, we're all so different. We all got different backgrounds. We've been brought up differently. We've got different things. So it's focus on, on yourself and then finding the right building blocks for yourself to make yourself the better person you can be. Um, challenging times or not, yeah, it's, you're going to give yourself the best opportunity to live a, a happy life. Yeah, I love that, mate. I love that. And obviously, people uh, are going through some incredible challenges right now uh, due to this, obviously, this um, um, pandemic and pandemic across the world, across Australia. Um, and maybe they were going through tough times before it happened. But if you were to you know, say something to these people because a lot of these people that are doing a little tough, we're watching an interview like this and feeling a little low, a little um, hard done by and maybe feeling a bit like you were in your footy career, which is, you know, a blanket of sadness in your life. What would be your, your best bit of advice for them? Well, for me, um, like when I went through the different stages of my uh, of depression and the hard, hard times is I didn't have balance in my life. Um, it was all football, or back then it was then it was all personal training. It was all family. It was all different. It was just it was just all of one one thing at one time. 
And for me now, it's, it's about keeping the right balance in life. Um, and that's in terms of my, my, my work's changed now. Like two and a half years ago, when I was at my worst, I was just doing all personal training. And now I'm back at the footy again. So I'm, not, I'm just a personal trainer Pilates instructor. I do football academy training every afternoon. I'm linked to the Eagles with AFLW. So I've got four different roles that I do. So that gives me, it's given me a lot of variety. So finding what I really wanted to do, and it took my wife to say to me, he goes, what, what do you really want? You know, like, and I and go, what do you love doing? I said, well, I love footy, and then, which is obvious. And then now I've packaged it in a way where, you know, I've got four different roles in my life where I'm not getting stale at doing one thing, you know, and I'm very fortunate to, to have created this for myself now in terms of work, which is great. But then now it's like, instead of being smashing myself with weights every day, now I, you know, like I do Pilates, yoga, meditation. I put all those things in place now where, you know, for me age now, I'm 40 to 42. And I want a long longevity of life. And, I, and every day, if I don't do one form of exercise, whether it's weights, Pilates or yoga, I've got to do one of them. If it's not, if I don't, if I miss it out, who cares? But then I meditate every day, you know, and it's bring yourself back to the present. Um, you know, my wife's been a very big advocate for that. She's all in self-development all the time. And it's, it's a key, key to everything to try and stay balanced. Um, and, you know, there's platforms like yourself with you guys doing Happiness Go, which is awesome, which people can find what's best for them and find, like I said earlier, everyone's, got, everyone's different. Everyone will find their own best remedy for them. Um, so for me, it's variety for my work. And now it's having the right platforms around me for you know, all that stuff in terms of exercise, but also fun, have fun. Like, like catch up with your mates, you know, with me and my wife, we've got good mates all together, but we've got our own friends, I go out with my boys, she goes out with their girls, and then also come, come together as a family, have fun as a family. So it's good to try and have, not locked away in one area, just try and have a variety of everything. And it's not, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm saying we try our best to, to do that, you know, then you'll find one area in your life might build up and you go, oh, gee, I need a release, I need a release. And then I might be, okay, well, Chad, go out with the boys tonight, you need it, you need it, you need to blow out with the boys or you know, vice versa. So it's, it's about finding the right time and the right place and having those avenues that you can call upon. I love that, mate. So fun, some really cool and good personal development routines, yoga, uh, you know, meditation, mindfulness. I love that. And then variety. I think they are absolute must in people's life because they are so important. And you, you know, people are so, everyone's guilty of this. Oh, I'm always so busy. Well, you should never be too busy to find something for yourself every single day, let alone, as you said, maybe I missed my workout, but I still make time to check in with my meditation for at least five minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, so, so important. Like, you just got to have those little things that you can call upon and not feel the, the, the build up, build up, build up, build up, they're just a big explosion. So having those little releases and, and check-ins, they're, they're, they're really, really good for you. Awesome, mate. And what does um, the next 12 months look like for you, Chad? Well, the next 12 months, um, well, footy's starting back up, so that, that's good to be watching on TV. You can't go to the games yet. Um, go to the Eagles. And <laughs> just the next 12 months is just, yeah, hopefully the coronavirus starts it's under control here pretty well. Hopefully when the restrictions keep releasing, um, doesn't, no, there's no more breakouts here. But in terms of that, it's just more staying healthy, uh, spending time with the family, watching some sport, having some fun, and, um, and just enjoying it, mate. Love it, mate. I love that. And, mate, before I let you go, and you've been absolutely awesome, we're doing, uh, you may have seen, like, that, that push-up challenge. We're doing, like, a a call out challenge to interviews. I think we've done 15 or 16 interviews with uh, sporting players across Australia this far. If you could call someone out and say, I would like to have an interview or see an interview with you and Happiness going happen to say, who would that person be? Jeez, you got me on the spot. Um, <laughs> can, can, can it be from anywhere or what? Or Any sporting code in Australia that we might have access to. Yeah, who would you like to hear from? Oh, I know this guy pretty well. Um, I reckon Mitchell Johnson, the cricketer, he's, he's a good man. We did a, an online campaign with him about five years ago and he's a really good advocate for mental health and, um, you know, with his career and what he's done. So he'd, he'd be a great man because yeah, all, all we've seen from Mitch is the big male and the, 
a fiery left arm bowler, but uh, he's got a great soft side to him, and, and he's a he's a great guy. I appreciate that, mate. And thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you being part of Happiness Co. and Happiness A. And uh, for everyone watching, make sure you uh, share this, uh, follow along, and, and make sure you're up for your health and happiness in these challenging times. All right, Thanks. Julian, and all the best being a father, mate. Good congratulations. Thanks, mate.